Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the uh, PM services of the Northfield Church of Christ for Sunday, March the 4th. I'm Mark Syme, the minister here at Northfield. We will sing several songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message for you that I hope will uh, lift all, us, all of us up just a little bit. Uh, we sing here at Northfield from Songs of Faith and Praise, I will give you the number of the song and the title, just in case you don't have that particular book that uh, you can Google uh, the song or you can uh, use the book that you have and hopefully sing along with us. And so the first song we will sing in our books is number 121. The title is Come Let Us All Unite to Sing. Come, let us all unite to sing. 121. <clears throat> Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin awake, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love. God is love. God is God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. Oh, tell to earth's remotest bound, God is love. In Christ we have redemption found. God is love. His blood has washed our sins away. His spirit turned our night to day. And now we can rejoice to say, God is love. God is God love. is love. God is God love. is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. Oh, happy is our portion here. God is love. His promises our spirits cheer. God is love. He is our sun and shield by day. Our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. Our God is love. 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 Come, let us all unite to sing that. God is love. The 
next song we will sing is number 136. 136. The title of this song is Love for All. 136. Love for All. Love for all, and can it be? Can I hope it is for me? I who strayed so long ago, strayed so far and fell so low. I, the disobedient child, wayward, passionate, and wild, I, who left my father's home in forbidden ways to roam, to my father can I go, at his feet myself I'll throw. In his house there yet may be place a servant's place for me. My father waiting stands. See, he reaches out his hands. God is love, I know, I see. Love for you, yes, even me. Before the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 763. 763, O Master, let me walk with thee. <clears throat> o Master, let me walk with thee. Oh, Master, let me walk with Thee In lowly paths of service free Tell me Thy secret, help me bear The strain of toil, the fret of care Help me, the slow of heart, to move by some clear winning word of love. <coughs> Teach me the way, would be to stay and guide them in the homeward way. In hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way. In peace that only Thou canst give with Thee, O Master, let me live. We come to the part of our service that we come to know as the Lord's Supper or uh, Communion. It's uh, an interesting part of our worship. It's interesting in that we have this vertical relationship with our God and our communion is with him, but it is one with each other as we commune together. We were instructed to do this in our New Testaments 
we know that Jesus instituted uh, this uh, memorial on the night in which he was betrayed when he shared the meal with his disciples and let them know. And he let them know that uh, the bread and the blood would be representative of his body and his blood, his body which would hang on the cross, his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And so as we gather about the table, help us to remember that monumental uh, sacrifice that Jesus made uh, foreknown in the plans of God that um, he would come to earth, live as a man, die as a man, and be resurrected uh, as a spirit of God. And that resurrection is our hope in that he resurrected from the dead, that we will one day live with God eternally and be resurrected. Uh, as we uh, solemnly remember this, let's give thanks for the bread. <clears throat> Our great Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine plan, you sent Jesus to us as a substitute for our sin. Uh, we know for a short time you had to forsake him. We know the pain and the agony that Jesus suffered on the cross, his body racked with pain. Uh, with those nails driven in his hands and his feet. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember the body that suffered on the cross. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. In the last of the plagues that God put upon the Egyptians before the children of Israel were released. Uh, the children of Israel were instructed to uh, put blood of the lamb over their lampposts. And with that, the angel of death would pass over them and their firstborn would not die. When we remember the blood of Jesus, we know that that blood of Jesus will keep the angel of death from us. And through Jesus' sacrifice and the blood that washes away our sins, that uh, we will one day uh, have that reward in heaven. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself one time for all. And it is at this time we remember the innocent blood that he shed, that life-giving blood that is uh, the blood of the New Testament, the blood that washes away our sins. Help us to always be appreciative of that sacrifice as we partake. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> With the Lord's Supper being completed, we're also instructed on the first day of the week to give that which we have prospered. Giving that which we have prospered does not mean automatic riches for all of us. It just means that we are following the instructions of New Testament teaching to give, to give, to give as we have prospered, to do this on the first day of the week. And uh, with that, let's remember that when uh, in Old Testament days, uh, they sacrificed and they brought things to the altar. They brought their best as we give back to the Lord. Let's give our best. Let's pray. <clears throat> our God and Heavenly Father, we just are so thankful this for this opportunity that we have to give back. We just pray that those that are in charge of these monies We'll use it for their intended purposes, that a church might grow, that others may come to the Lord, that those that are in need uh, may be tended to. Be with us as we give. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we sing is one that probably many of you can sing without a book. It is number 83 in our song books. The song is God is so good. God 
is so good. <clears throat> God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He cares for me. He's so good to me. I love him so. I love him so. I love him so. He's so good to me. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. He's so good to me. That concludes the song and the singing part of our service to the Lord and our observance of the Lord's Supper. I now have a message that I hope will be beneficial to all of us. Again, if you were there this morning, uh, you heard that the title of uh, this lesson would be <coughs> Commanded to Love. Commanded to Love. You know, in the minds of many, uh, love is simply an emotion. Uh, it's a feeling perhaps that uh, cannot be forced. And with that, uh, emotions can come and go, can't they? We can feel sad in one moment, happy in another moment. Uh, it can come and go to the point where we would say, I love you, uh, or I don't love you anymore. But with that, New Testament teaching commands us to love. And with that, we are not just, it's not just an act of goodwill, but it's also the sense of affection and friendship. Now, there are several words in the Greek language that uh, denote love. And I would just like to share two of them with you this evening. I'm sure you have probably heard of both of those. The first and the deepest of those love is called agape love. Agape love uh, is active good will. It's love that works. It's love that is shown by one's actions. It is that love that is commanded of us. The other word is phileo. Vallejo is a fondness or a friendship. Sometimes we call it brotherly love. Cannot be forced. And it is also something that we are commanded to do. Now, the distinction between agape and phileo is not always easy to see. As a matter of fact, I would contend that they actually overlap with one another. Agape can also be defined as brotherly love and affection. And phileo is also commanded by the scriptures. So for a few moments this evening, I'd like us to just review some of those things, to bring those things back to mind to each one of us so that they will take greater meaning in our minds and in our hearts. First, we are commanded to love. When Jesus was asked in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, by those that were trying to trick him, uh, what's the greatest command? And we know that. 
We know that in Mark chapter 12, verse 30, he said that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. And so we are commanded to love. Now, I would maintain that that is agape love. That is an active love. It is a love that has to be within us every moment of every day. The love that we have for our God, because God commanded it of us. We are also commanded to love uh to love Jesus and to love Jesus even more than family. And that is phileo love. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22, and Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 37, where Jesus said, you, you actually have to love me more than your family. And so we are to love God and Jesus. We are to love those within our community. Mark chapter 12, verse 34 tells us that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. That's community, to love our neighbor as ourself. And then Jesus laid the really difficult one on us in the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44 where he told us that we must love our enemies as ourself. Very, very difficult. And that is also agape love. It's an active love. Many of us have families. Uh, some of our families are very, very close knit. Um, we had two of our children uh, in our home yesterday uh, and our two grandchildren in our home. It was a, a wonderful time that our uh, at least two-thirds of our family had together. The Bible explains to us how husbands are supposed to love their uh, wives. And that even includes cherish their wives. We find this in the second chapter of Ephesians, uh, fifth chapter of Ephesians, verses 25 and then verses 28 to 29. Wives are also to love their husbands. It is an agape love and a phileo love. Not only do we love one another as a, um, as a husband and wife, but we love each other as a friend. Good marriages, when we look at our mates, we look at them and we say, they are not just our love and our lovers, but they are our friends. We are to love those within the church. In John chapter 13, verse 34, we are told that we are to love one another as Christ loved us. And so this is how we love one another within our fellowship. We are to uh, have a kindly affection or love of family to one another, because our church is indeed our family. We are the family of God. This is agape love, and I believe it overlaps into fraternal love. It's a brotherly love, because these people are a part of our family. And so it should be apparent by now that we are commanded to love and it often requires something that's true, that's heartfelt, that there is an affection toward one another, whether they be our spouses, our children, whether they may, whether they are brethren within the church. If it's commanded, it's something that we can develop where it's lacking. And it's something that can grow. And by the grace of God, we can be taught how to do that. And with that comes the second part of our lesson. And that part of our lesson is that we are taught to love. Now you might ask that question, how are we taught to love? 
Well, first, we're taught to love by God. Concerning brotherly love, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9 says that we are to love one another. God loved us so much, John 3, 16, that he sent his son to us. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 to 10. So God taught us to love by being the example. He sent his son to us. Jesus taught us how to love. When Jesus hung on the cross and died for us, he did it because he loved us. And how did he love us? He loved us actively, agape. He loved us as brothers and sisters, phileo. We know that Jesus loved his disciples, John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5. And John 13, uh, starting in verse 1 and ending in verse 34, he loved these three people that were very close to him, Mary, Lazarus, and Martha. And finally, uh, it talks about how he loved his disciple who became an apostle, and that was John. In John chapter 13, verse 23, and chapter 20, verse 2, he actually referred to John as the one that he loved. And that was not just an agape love, but a phileo love as well. The apostle Paul taught Christians how to love. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, Paul says that we are to walk in love. And as we mentioned before, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 to 33, he taught husbands and wives how to love one another. And finally, the apostle Paul practiced brotherly love. Every letter that he wrote when he wrote to the Philippians, to the Colossians, to the Thessalonians, he wrote in love because for the most part, he had planted those churches. He had a brotherly affection for them. He had a heartfelt affection for them. The apostle Peter also taught us how to love. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, and chapter 4, verse 8, he taught us to love one another. Uh, he, he taught it, and, and the term that's used there is that we are to love fervently. That's a powerful word, to love with fervency. That means all of our hearts and all of our souls are involved in this love. And Peter taught that in First Peter. He also taught us to love the brotherhood. He taught us to love one another. That is not just agape, but that's phileo love. In First Peter chapter 2, verses, verse 17, and chapter 3, verse 8. And he also, uh, in Second Peter 3, 15, practice brotherly love, and he challenged each of us to practice brotherly love in our lives. Finally, we're taught by other Christians to love. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it said us, says, let us uh, show those how to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Who's he talking about? He's talking about our brothers and sisters in Christ to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Within the church community in uh, Titus chapter 2 verses 3 and 4, the older women are instructed to teach the younger women and even young Christians are told to set examples on how to love. Timothy was younger uh, than Paul, and he said to Timothy, "Don't anybody, don't let anybody despise you just because you're young. 
you can still set the bar. You can still, still set the example. And you know what? Our love should be a work in progress. We can develop, we can develop heartfelt affection. Vallejo, brotherly love, can be enhanced by adding this agape, this heartfelt affection to it. Peter explained that in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. And so with that, as Christians, we are to demonstrate the active goodwill of agape and the heartfelt affection of Vallejo. That's what Paul explained to the Thessalonian brethren in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. Do you know what? There's no excuse in a Christian's life for the lack of heartfelt love toward Jesus, toward our brethren, or toward our families. Um, even though there's a distinction between agape and phileo, we are commanded to love in both of those ways in the scripture. And where we lack a heartfelt love toward Jesus or our brethren or our members, we know that we need to make improvement. When there is a deficiency, we need to lift ourselves up out of that. Sometimes we have to relearn, we have to retool to have that love grow within us. And when we need to learn love and love of others with a heartfelt love, we look at the examples that the Father gave us by sending Jesus, that Jesus gave us by dying, that the apostles did in their Holy Spirit-inspired teachings, and that Christians do one for another as they show that love. I would challenge you this evening to take that initiative to practice heartfelt love, to Practice that brotherly affection so that it will grow and it will be nurtured. And we are to just show unfeigned and affectionate love one to another. That's that phileo love. And we love one another fervently with that agape love as we should. I hope this lesson, uh, brought to home, brought home uh, the importance of loving one another. Much of the scriptures uh, are steeped in love. God loved the world. He loved it. He created us. We are created in his image. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about being created in the spiritual image of our God? He wants us all. He doesn't want any of us to be lost. And he's explained that in the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures. And so what he did for us was he laid out a plan for us by which we can achieve salvation by taking the word of God into our hearts and through that repenting of our former lives, confessing Jesus as the son of God and being baptized for the remission of our sins. If you have not done that, as of yet, and you're not a child of God, if you need to, please be in touch with us. We will be there for you to help you to start your walk with the Lord. Let's end this service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, as we uh, complete this lesson, help us to just appreciate, understand uh, the just monumental importance of having love in our lives. The, the agape love, the active goodwill, and the phileo love, the fondness and the friendship. We are commanded to do both of those, and we just pray that our love will grow each day as we learn more about your will for us. Bless us in this. Help us uh, 
and nurture us so that we will have that love grow within our hearts so that people will look at us and say, they're Christians. I can tell by how they love. Continue to be with us, dear Heavenly Father. Bless us, comfort us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God.